You're listening to The Social Workers on WCDB Albany. Good morning. Welcome to The Social Workers. I'm Catherine Zox, your social worker with a microphone. You're listening to WCDB FM here in Albany, New York. Um, how are you this morning, Andrew? I am doing all right. Good. Andrew's my board op. Do I have to always announce that you're the board op? Everybody knows that you are the board op for yeah, the social workers, right? I think so. Yeah. But I, I like my character is good as the as the um, as the what the board op <laughs> as the board op. I'm Andrew the board op. Andrew the board op, and I'm Catherine Zox. And I did say you're listening to the social workers, right? Well, yeah. today we have one guest, Andrew, and we also have Hillary Kloss, MSW School of Social Welfare, who's going to join us every Thursday morning for ten minutes to tell us about what's happening in the School of Social Work on campus, activities that are related to social workers, things you may or may not want to do, but we want to give you that information. And then our guest is. Uh, Sean T. Smith. He's a psychologist, and he's the author of The User's Guide to the Human Mind, Why Our Brains Make Us Unhappy, Anxious, and Neurotic, and What We Can Do About It. I'm excited for this caller. Yeah, the, book, the book looks really, really interesting. Yeah, the cover looks good, right? Mm-hmm. It's a picture of a brain, kind of like a, a cartoon brain. Yeah, and a guy who looks like he's a thumb, yeah. sort of pointing at the brain. <laughs> it's very it's, cool. Yeah. Also, uh, I can identify with this, although I think most people can. I mean, we unhappy, anxious, and neurotic, and what we can do about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and maybe in his book, he talks about what we can do about it. We don't necessarily have to be in therapy with a psychologist or a social worker, but there are things that we can do on our own if we're feeling this way to alleviate some of mm-hmm. the, the distress or the stress that our brains cause and we have these thoughts that we don't want to have so anyway i'm not going to go into it yeah. but uh, yeah so it'll be helpful it will be helpful so do we have hillary on the line yet we no? do okay hillary how are you this morning i'm good how are you guys doing great great so okay what's happening this is uh thursday morning what is this december 1st yes good uh, already into december i know hillary did you get my email this morning telling you what yes, to put up I on did. good on facebook great yes i did and i did right as soon as i woke up i have to say hillary you are amazing you are <laughs> you are amazing you do so many things maybe i said this last week but i mean hillary is an msw student she is now an integral part of the radio show i can't even begin to tell you what she does on a daily basis besides her homework or internship or other activities and yet you have this very calm demeanor now yeah well you kind of have to especially in this field you know in social work you just kind of have to take everything in stride and do what you can so i'm more than happy to help in any way that i can and i've loved getting involved in the social workers radio show and i'm looking forward to seeing what we can do in the future terrific so what can we do now what's available what what's what can we look forward to, I guess, this week, this weekend, uh, or in the next couple of weeks, what's happening around campus related to social work activities? Yeah, we have a very busy couple of weeks coming off from a Thanksgiving break here and ending right before the semester's over. Uh, actually, tonight, in honor of World AIDS Day, which is today, um, the College of St. Rose is hosting a film screening of the movie Still Around, 30 Years of AIDS, 15 Stories of Hope. And what the film is, it's a feature-length compilation of 15 short films about surviving and thriving with HIV-AIDS. Um, and that's tonight at the College of St. Rose, which is at 420 Western Avenue on the second floor of their campus center. And it's from 6 to 8 p.m. Hillary, and did you see in the pic? Go ahead. Oh, and it's free of charge, so it's open to all community members, including students. Good, because free is the word we like to hear. But yes. uh, yeah, <laughs> there was an article in the newspaper in the Times Un- Union today, the Albany Times Union, mm-hmm. about HIV/AIDS, and they have are in the. They haven't actually come up with a vaccine, but they are in the process of perhaps developing a vaccine that will prevent one from getting AIDS. Really? Yeah. It's, That's interesting. Yeah, it is. New research. And, uh, yeah. and that was in the Times Union today. So that fits yeah. what you're talking about for the program tonight. Okay, go on. What else? Yep. Okay. So then that's it for tonight. Tomorrow night, uh, Dr. Michael O'Leary, who is a professor at the School of Social Welfare, is bringing his band, the 45s, to uh, McGeary's Pub in downtown Albany. And they're doing a fundraiser for the School of Social Welfare's NOLA service learning trip to New Orleans that they're taking over winter break. Um, and Mr. 
Dr. O'Leary is a great man. I had him this summer as a professor. He's brilliant, and he's bringing his band, and it should be a good time. Um, it's $7 to buy a wristband, and they have specials all night, and the proceeds are going to go to the school social welfare trip to New Orleans in January. How much money do they think they'll raise? That's a great idea. What, what, does, he I, pl- what does he play? Or what, is he a guitarist? Uh, and a vocalist. And? Yep. Yeah, and he has his Ph.D., his LCSW. He's just a great man, and I believe his sons are in his band as well, so it's a family band. That's cool. So how much, yeah, yeah do they have, do you have any kind of a, a, a goal in terms of how much money you need to raise, or? Um, they don't have a goal. Really, what it is is as much money as they can raise will go towards reducing the cost that the students have to pay out of pocket to go to New Orleans. Terrific. So, and, yeah. yeah. And the buzz around the school social welfare is that everyone is going to go. So I think they're going to have a really good turnout. Terrific. So that's yeah. great. Yeah. So, And I know that they've done this trip. Uh, I actually had some of those students on the show last year who went to New Orleans. And uh, it's quite a trip. It's, uh, it's uh, a place. Yeah. yeah, it is. I think it's their ninth or tenth year going. Uh, I, yeah. I didn't know how often they had been. But, of course, after the... the uh, hurricane and the destruction and all of that i know that they've been down there and helping etc so it's a good good project get out there listen to dr o'leary yeah yeah okay at mcgarry's right. <laughs> yes <laughs> professor o'leary at mcgarry's <laughs> <laughs> all right and then uh, next week on thursday december 8th we have a lunch and learn at the capital district center for independence in albany on central avenue about accessing transportation so CDTA, the Capital District Transit Authority, is going to come in and talk about how to access it, their new routes, um, and how that might benefit some of our clients um, here in the Capital Region. So that's from 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Thursday, December 8th at Capital District Center for Independence, 875 Central Ave, South 4, Albany, New York. How do you get to go to all of these? Or It seems impossible. You can't go to all of these activities, can you? Or how do you pick and choose? Well, I mean, I personally am not able to go to a lot of these only because of my schedule, but what I do when I see programs like this is you kind of have to prioritize and say, is this going to be beneficial to me and the people I'm working with? That's really important. So whenever I see a program on aging or on people with um, disabilities, whether it's developmental or physical, I always try to go to those events because I feel like that's going to be beneficial to me. And it's also an opportunity. I mean, when are these events going to be coming around again? So you kind of have to weigh everything all at once. But um, there's a lot of programs out there um, every single week, you know, some that we are not even able to announce here on the social workers only because I don't know about them. But the Capital District is doing a great job of reaching out to people and trying to offer these types of programs to them. Well, you're doing a good job of, like, sort of culling out the ones that I obviously that uh, are relevant for social workers. And uh, as you say, each one of us have to has to decide what's – we have to focus with what's going right. to be good for us. And, uh, you know, if you're in, in school, what's going to be good for your practice? So, yeah. yeah. So, All right. And yeah. there's one last announcement um, that I especially want to make, and it's that the School of Social Welfare Scholarship application is due next Friday, December 9th. So any students right now, unfortunately, students graduating in December are not eligible, but even the ones graduating in May are still eligible to apply. And the applications are due December 9th, which is next Friday. And what students need is to complete the application form. They need two letters of recommendation, a resume, and an unofficial transcript, which they can get right from their My Albany. Hillary, is that the scholarship for an MSW or a PhD program? Yep, or BSWs, all school social welfare students. Um, they have specific scholarships for each degree program, but there are some for all levels. So how much money are we talking? Different scholarships give out different different levels of monies, or how does that work? Oh, no. Um, so for like the BSW program, I think there's 10 or 11 different scholarships that they're eligible to apply for. Um, for the MSWs, it's a little bit more. And then the PhDs, I believe there are five scholarships um, that are just specifically for PhD social work students. How long um, does it... I, I believe you have a scholarship as well. I do. I have a scholarship yeah. Yeah, for MSW students. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, so at all levels, uh, BSW, MSW, PhD. Um, yep. Yeah. And it's important to stress that 
all students who are graduating in May or even those continuing on are eligible. So I'm graduating in May, but I'm still eligible to apply for these scholarships because technically they're accounting for this academic year. Oh, that's great. Well, that's good to know. And, and you know, um, so is this posted around the School of Social Welfare as well, besides, you know, announcing it on our show? Does everybody know? Does everybody have access to this information? Yep, it's been sent out on the listserv, which all MSW students are required to sign up for. Um, it's also posted online on their website, albany.edu forward slash SSW for School of Social Welfare. And um, I believe physical applications are in the student lounge, which is in the basement of Richardson. Great. Okay, we're yeah. going to, yeah, so we'll say goodbye. One more thing, what about our tabling thing? Do we want to talk, mention that? Yes, um, it hasn't been confirmed yet, oh, but. Can we, you, better, can we not, should we not say anything? <laughs> well, I mean, well, let's do it. And, you know, if we're there, we're there. If we're not, then they'll tune in next Thursday and we'll figure out where to meet them. All right, great. So tell them. Yes. Yeah, so next Tuesday, um, the Social Workers mm-hmm. Radio Show is hoping to table in the Houston Cafe from 1130 to 1 p.m. And it'd be a great opportunity to swing by, see what we're doing, and also figure out how you can get involved as students. Great. Terrific. Thanks, Hillary. Have You're a great welcome. day. Talk to you next you Thursday. All right, bye. Bye. Hillary Kloss, MSW, Catherine Zox, your social worker with the microphone. You're listening to The Social Workers on WCDB FM 90.9, Albany, New York. We'll be back in a minute. Hi, I'm Melissa. You know me as a rocker from Leavenworth, Kansas. What if I also told you that my dad was my hero, I love oysters, and I hate Brussels sprouts. Oh, and I'm a lesbian, too. I'm Melissa Etheridge. Stereotypes don't tell you much about a person. Here's an honest reminder. Labels belong on records and not on people. Brought to you as a public service by Human Rights Campaign Fund Foundation. Okay, forest animals, today is a new day. Kids are coming to the forest, and it's up to us to make their visit a good one. Sparrow. Yes? Have you practiced the most popular bird songs for the year? Of course. Catchy. I like it. Okay, river. Dude. How's the temperature? It's a refreshing 52 degrees, man. Perfect for a little riverside shoeless relaxation. Ah, good. Owl, you hear? Of course. Hoo-hoo, Jaskin. I am. Look, you know the drill. Sleep during the day, scare the kids at night. Perfect. I love my job. Uh, oak tree? What's up? Still in the same place I left you last year. That's what I like. Consistency. Well, it's not like I'm going anywhere for the next couple hundred years. I know. I love it. Uh, turtle. Turtle. He's not here yet, man. Uh, he's late every morning. You'd think he would have learned by now to leave the night before our meetings. Okay. Squirrel. Has anybody seen Mr. Mr. Squirrel? Squirrel? The forest has been preparing just for you. Visit a forest near you today. To learn more about cool things to do in the forest, visit discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. We're back. I'm Catherine Zox, your social worker with a microphone. You're listening to The Social Workers on WCDB, FM 90.9, Albany, New York. And joining me this morning is our guest, Sean T. Smith. He's a psychologist in private practice in Denver, Colorado. Lives with his wife, daughter, and dog. And his new book is The User's Guide to the Human Mind, Why Our Brains Make Us Unhappy, Anxious, and Neurotic, and What We Can Do About It. Um on the back of his book, he says, is your mind driving you crazy? I guess my answer is yes, and what can we do about it? Welcome to the show. Nice to have you on, Sean. Good morning. How are you this morning? Doing well. I'm in, I'm in Denver, and it's snowing, and it's still a little dark here. <laughs> a little cold and a little dark. Well, I'm in upstate New York, and it's uh, sunny, and it's not snowing. So uh, for once, we have good weather. But, okay, yes. is your mind driving you crazy? We were look- I mean, I read the book, and then I was talking about it with my board op, Andrew White, who's a student. Well, no, he just graduated, actually. Um, and we all can identify with this, the user's guide to the human mind. Our mind does make us crazy. You're a psychologist. I'm a social worker. You know, people that come to us who feel this way usually, unhappy, anxious, and neurotic, we, they're in therapy. I, I see them in therapy, or I have when I was in private practice. But uh, in your book, you say we, we have control. We can sort of take care of ourselves and quell our, our brains so that we don't feel unhappy, anxious, and neurotic. We don't necessarily have to be in therapy. 
Oh, definitely, up to a point. And, you know, I, there are extreme cases where uh, anxiety or depression gets to an unbearable point, and, you know, I, I don't really go into that in the book. That's a place, that is a topic for therapy. But, yeah, there's quite a bit that we can do on our own to learn how to come to terms and live with these minds of ours. Why do our minds, What? why do we do this to, I say we do this to ourselves. You talk about worry, anxiety, pessimism, jealousy, self-criticism, all those negative things. Why does our mind do that? Why, what happens to us? What's the purpose for it? The short answer to that, I think, is that what most of what the mind does, I would say that, that almost all of what the mind does, it does to protect us. It does to insulate us from social isolation or dangers in the world. It's always looking out for us, and it gets a little overbearing at times. So what you're saying is that it, it has to do with survival. So we worry, we're pessimistic, we're concerned, we're anxious, so that we will be on our guard, so that we can survive. Is that what you're saying? Survive in our in our environment? Sure, I can give you a couple of examples of that. Pessimism is, is a wonderful example because there's been some nice research on that lately. But um, pessimism appears to be the mind's error management system in, in essence. So if, um, imagine if you're you know, living several thousand years ago and you're tracing through the forest and you're looking for your next meal, you hear this rustling off to the side of you in the bushes. And the mind is going to do some calculations about that. And you could bet that one of two things. You could bet that it, it's nothing and you proceed as, as if it's nothing and you just go about your merry way. Or you could bet that it's something dangerous, and if it's something dangerous, you better slow down and assess the situation before you proceed. Now, that second thought is kind of a pessimistic thought. You hear a rustling in the, in the woods, and, and you assume that it's a bear or something, something dangerous. That's pessimism. But it's also the safe bet, and this is what the mind does. It calculates what's going on around you in the world, and it makes bets about what's going to happen. And a lot of times those bets are the conservative bets. They're the they're the kind of the pessimistic bets, but that's one of the things that keeps us alive. So that's that's an example of brain of the mind uh, looking at what's going on in the world around you. But it's also very concerned about relationships because we are social creatures, and so you know we can't be out on our own, especially as as we were you know, coming up and the, and the world was a more dangerous place. Um, you know, there are stories about Inuit peoples uh, getting rid of sociopaths by pushing them out on an ice floe. That's the worst thing that could happen to us is to be uh, separated from our group. And so the mind is very careful about relationships, and that's why we get a lot of worries and a lot of anxieties about how other people are relating to us. You know, what does it mean when my boss gives me kind of an un, you know, an ambiguous signal, some sentence that I can't make sense of? The mind will ruminate on that to try to make sense of it, and that's really the root of a lot of our worry. Well, can we fast forward? Let's take that first example, foraging in the forest and looking for food. We hear a rustle. We have to assume it's not a good thing uh, because that's prote- that protects us. But can we fast forward that to like now? Um, or is that the same example as the, the boss? You know, he says something. Well, that's relationship. That's different. So what about giving us an example of, of pessimism related to that. We haven't evolved, it sounds like. We haven't evolved, is it? Because that doesn't really fit our modern-day society, does it, that kind of pessimism? There's a lot of thought out there that our minds uh, aren't particularly wired for the way the world is today. I, I don't know how true that is, but I, I do know it's true that we carry around the same wiring that we had 10,000 years ago for the most part, and um, we are still wired for that dangerous world. And, of course, we're still wired for the social war because we're still social creatures. But it's not helpful to us, is it? I mean, from an evolutionary standpoint, it's making us depressed, neurotic, scared, anxious. Um, So what do we do about it? Because it doesn't really fit, does it? Yeah, I love that question. That's a fabulous question because my uh, one of my tenets, one of the foundations of the book is that your brain is a modular thing, meaning that it's not just one giant network. It's, it's different parts doing different things. And for the most part, your brain doesn't care if you're happy. It cares if you're alive. And so there, there's a lot of... Uh, resources in the mind devoted to keeping you alive and this this concept of happiness is a newer thing this exists and if you think of the, the physical brain um, the front of the brain right above your eyes is is a part where that sort of concept tends to live uh, you can't really pin it down to one location but my point being that it's a newer concept that 10,000 years ago people probably weren't so worried about being happy it's a luxury that we have that we can worry about it and so 
the answer to that question, I think, is not is to learn how to not follow your mind when your mind is giving you a lot of worry and anxiety and depressive thoughts. Um, not to fight it or try to do, to eliminate it because that can turn it into its own battle. We can discuss that in a minute if you want. But to learn to understand what your mind is trying to tell you, um, which means watching your mind sort of from a distance and deciding if what your mind is telling you is correct. And then you have choices at that point. And so you can either follow what your mind is telling you or you can follow some higher values that you set for yourself. And, and I think of happiness more as a behavior than as a feeling that, that we need to wait for. So happiness is kind of a, a new phenomenon, you're saying, a kind of, that we've decided we need to be happy. But traditionally, in order to survive as human beings, happiness really wasn't part of the equation. It really hasn't. I don't think it was even part of the equation so much maybe even a hundred years ago, let alone a thousand years ago. Survival was is what we have, you know, which was the the goal, right? Yeah, and I suspect that, you know, a hundred years ago or ten thousand years ago that people were still motivated to do things that made them happy, like have sex and eat food and, and have friends. But, you know, this this ability to sit around and, and kind of worry about happiness, yeah, this is a new luxury for human beings, I, I imagine. So, okay, let's... What do we do? How do we get rid of some of this stuff that isn't working for us now? Uh, as you said, the f- uh, one thing you just mentioned was that we have to be able to evaluate our feelings. We wake up in the morning. Uh, I mean, I think some people wake up in the morning and they are anxious. They are anxious about going to work. They're anxious about are they going to get be able to accomplish what they have to do during the day. They wake up anxious and concerned and pessimistic and, uh, and could be defined as neurotic. So how do we change that? I th- well, I'm not such a huge advocate of changing it. I'm, I know there's, I should take that back. I'm an advocate of changing it in some cases, you know, that you and I are both uh, in the field, so we know this term cognitive disputation, and that's a that's a, a term that talks about looking at your thoughts and arguing with them in, in a way to change them or eliminate them. So, for example, if I think that I can't go to gym because people are going to uh, judge me when I get there, um, you, you can take a thought like that, look at the logic of it, kind of take it apart and try to put it together back in a, in a logical way. And that kind of but thing... But I have to stop you there, Sean, because I can't go to the gym. Why? I'm too fat. I, I put on my... I'm afraid people are going to look at me and make fun of me because I, I don't have a good uh, physique or a good body. Well, sure. A lot of people are... are very concerned about social judgment. That goes back to that, that wiring that we have. We're concerned about what other people think. And so people will, it's a very common experience for someone to think, I can't go to the gym, for example, because I'm worried that people are going to judge me. And they don't even have to say anything. It would almost be easier if you went to a gym and, and people said what they were thinking. But we imagine what they're thinking. And that's the thing that we really are afraid of, is our thoughts about what other people might be thinking. All right, so you're saying that's what? What do we do? Then we don't go to the gym, which is not a good thing, and that's not a healthy thing because we're afraid of what other people are thinking. We don't really know what they're thinking, but it prevents us from doing something that's healthy for us, exercising. Sure, and so a co- there are a couple of ways to approach that. One one you've mentioned, which is to look at the logic of that and try to change your thoughts. And, um, you yeah, know, that, that works, in my experience, when... Uh, when it's not a terribly, when it's not a thought that's terribly ingrained in you. So if I, you know, if I grew up thinking that people are judging my physical appearance, and that is is a thought that really, really troubles me, changing it is going to be more difficult than if it's just kind of a transient thought that's getting in the way. And so you can work on changing it. You can also work on just recognizing what that thought is trying to accomplish understanding it, and then deciding whether or not you want to listen to it, which is kind of a subtle distinction, but um, it's, in the long run, I think, easier not to fight your thoughts than it is to fight them. And I'm kind of a lazy guy in that regard. I don't want to spend a lot of energy fighting my own mind. I'd rather just try to understand what it's telling me and then make my own decisions. We have to step back, are you saying, and and evaluate what we're thinking. That's what you're saying. And then decide whether it's going to be helpful or it's not helpful or um, these particular thoughts, whatever it is, being concerned about what other people think. Uh, Because being concerned about what other people think in some cases, as you say, is important. It's important to 
be aware of your behavior and how it doesn't fit into a situation and people will judge you if you walk into a if you're in a movie theater and you're talking <laughs> uh, during the whole movie it's important for you to realize people aren't going to like that what are people going to think right yeah and that's a good example of the mind working in your favor giving you a, a thought that in one context is uh, can be really troubling if my mind is giving me the message that people are watching me when I go to the gym. That can be kind of destructive, but you're pointing out a scenario where it could be very helpful to know that people are watching and judging. You talk about uh, delayed gratification in the book. Uh, for those who don't know what that is, let's talk about delayed gratification and how does that fit into the user's guide to the human mind? Yeah, one of my favorite topics because um, we're like any other animal on Earth in, in the sense that we are motivated to um, gratify our needs right now. Delayed gratification means, of course, deferring it for the future, so you know, saving money for the future rather than going out and buying that new coat today. Um, it doesn't come naturally to us. There's there's a part of our mind that wants to do that, obviously, to these newer parts of the mind that are concerned with things like happiness. But most of the mind is concerned with getting needs met immediately. So if you're hungry, you better find something to eat. If you're cold, you better find warmth. Um, and this goes back to, you know, I think, us coming up on, in a much more cruel world where it was kind of hard to find food and heat. And so we get strong motivations to satisfy those things immediately. The way it... Um, comes into play in the book is that uh, this is one of the forces that we're constantly battling against. So if it's uh, something like anxiety, so if you're talking about, for example, going back to our anxiety about the gym, not wanting to go to the gym for the fear of what other people might be thinking, the immediate gratification if you were going to, to take an immediate gratification approach to that, it would be just to avoid the gym so that, number one, you don't have to face those thoughts that are so troubling about what other people might think. And then, number two, you also get to stay home where it's nice and comfy and cozy. And so um, that's the immediate gratification. It's a constant force for us, and um, it takes practice to learn how to seek out that delayed gratification, which would mean, in this case, taking those feelings or those thoughts about what other people might be thinking and really embracing them and, and allowing them to exist while you take your butt to the gym and sitting through that discomfort it doesn't yep. come naturally to us so we yeah so we have to we have to work on it in other words it, it's not a, a natural uh, process for us but give us another example I mean that's a gym what other things in our daily lives that that most of us are confronted with when it would be good for us to delay gratification and we tend not to do that how about food and drink I um, mean you know, we, we have how about, about it I, we just finished diet. Thanksgiving <laughs> yeah there, there are how many diets have I mean how many would you estimate how many diets are diet plans are out there right now in the dozens hundreds I, how many diet plans I would say probably in the thousands they're diet plans yeah probably if you add them up over the years they're yeah, maybe tens of thousands who knows but the point being that there are a lot of diet plans out there the reason being that our mind wants what it wants and so these diet plans are all designed to outmaneuver our mind, all designed to outmaneuver this need we have for immediate gratification. It's a very difficult thing. If, if it didn't exist, then there would be no need for diets out there because we could all just uh, make our own decisions about food without having to battle our minds. So what's the solution to this? <laughs> it's uh, the solution to, well... Weight loss is, is a tough one. There are a lot of reasons that people are, uh, eat too much. Um, and so it, it would help to understand what a person's particular reason is. But I think ultimately it's going to boil down to, for most people, sitting with some discomfort, whether it's food or alcohol or, or whatever it is. These things can take on functions that go beyond just satisfying the basic needs. So, for example, alcohol. Um, I'm sure you're very familiar with that as a social worker, that it can uh, come to satisfy needs like the need to avoid pain, um, the need to escape your own thoughts. A lot of people, when they get into a habit of drinking, it's because they notice that drinking kind of quiets their mind. It gives them a nice little break from this constant chatter and the constant pain that comes from their own mind. And so it becomes something that, that can become very comforting to them, and it's an immediate gratification. It's an immediate uh, escape from their mind. And learning to overcome that almost always means learning to sit with what your mind is telling you. And what your mind is telling you is usually not as bad as it seems once you uh, face it. Yeah, that's it. It sounds easy when you say it, but uh, yeah, it does. 
<laughs> yeah, but it's not that easy to do. Okay, you've written the user's guide to the human mind. I keep mentioning it in case uh, people want to purchase the book, buy the book. Uh, it, it, as define it as a roadmap to the puzzling inner workings of the human mind. Um, what made you decide to write this book as a psychologist? Is this a result of all the experience you've had with your patients or um, or, or yourself? Because I know you're a blogger as well. Um, how would you get the idea for this book? Where I got the idea for the book is it comes out of a behavioral school, and that may not mean too much to, to somebody who's not part of the profession. But, you know, within the profession, there are different schools of thought and um, I come from the cognitive behavioral school, and the cognitive behavioral school of psychology these days relies a lot on mindfulness. And mindfulness being, uh, I guess you could describe it as watching your mind and being aware of what your mind is doing. And I noticed that mindfulness is usually presented from from an Eastern kind of philosophy. So, if you've ever read an article online about mindfulness, there's Usually, well, there's often some stock photo of, for example, a beautiful young white woman sitting on a sandy beach in the lotus position. And I, that, to me, is kind of iconic of the way that mindfulness is presented by psychologists. And there's nothing wrong with that. That, that works for a lot of people, that, that melding of East and West and bringing uh, the, the Eastern meditative practices into psychology. It's a wonderful tool. The problem that I notice is that there are a lot of people for whom that just doesn't work, that that. Um, that approach, that Eastern approach, doesn't work for them for whatever reason, or they can't relate to, uh, for example, that icon of the woman sitting on the sandy beach. It, it just, it just doesn't work for them. It just doesn't click for a variety of reasons. And there are other ways to get to mindfulness that really weren't being addressed in the field very, very um, openly. And science is one of those. So if you understand, so that's the approach I take with the book. If you understand what the mind is trying to do, how the brain is built, um, then you can gain some distance. You can watch it from a distance, just like Eastern meditative practices will help you watch it from a distance. But it's a different way to get to that same end. So, you know, I agree with you. I think that that, that you know, the beautiful girl sitting on the beach is something I've never been able to relate to. Um, and so this, the, the, your book is sort of puts it in a much more, you're able to do the mindfulness in a much more practical way, I guess. It's, it's or at least that's how it was. I mean, I know what cognitive behavior therapy is. Uh, maybe you want to explain that to, you know, our listeners, and we have a lot of social workers who are listening, but uh, what is cognitive behavior therapy as opposed to psychoanalytic therapy? Oh, sorry. Cognitive behavior therapy versus psychoanalytic, I guess, um, and you can help me out with this. I know you're, you're an expert in the I'm going to let you do it. <laughs> I'm going to let it's you do it. Let me see if I can sum this up quickly. It's a complicated question. Cognitive behavior therapy tends to go, it tends to be a shorter term therapy than um, psychoanalytic. And they're both good. They both have their advantages. Psychoanalytic, uh, I guess, if you were going to a psychoanalytic therapist, you would be looking at uh, really how your mind came to function as it does. And you'd, you'd be understanding what kind of relationships have shaped you and how they've shaped you, whereas cognitive behavioral therapy is more just, let's cut to the chase, let's find out what kind of thoughts and feelings are bothering you. We don't need to know necessarily where they all come from, although that's useful information sometimes. We're just going to keep this short and quick and, and try to get you out of here. We'll find, we'll identify those thoughts and we'll find a way to deal with them. Yeah, that's a good example. We, I think social workers use that a lot. I mean, cognitive behavior therapy, short-term therapy, uh, you know, there's a beginning, there's an end. As you say, there's a problem or we're going to deal with that problem and we're not necessarily going to have to know how your mother or your father treated you or go way back to when you were two and a half years old and the impact that had on you developmentally and all that kind of stuff. So it's a very practical way of providing therapy or counseling for individuals. It's short term and it's also less costly. Then yeah, it's like, you said it much better than I did. Thank you. No, <laughs> just keep repeating it because people. I, I often get that question though. Well, you know, like what is the difference? And I know that uh, as a social worker, that is, you know, one of the practices that we do use. It also works well with, I think, um, uh, drugs and alcohol and overeating and those kinds of, of problems or those kinds of issues. So that is the difference. And and. 
So let, let's talk about you personally, because I always like to hear your story. You know, you wrote this book, but what about your story? How did you, you know, I mean, uh, did you start writing this book also as a result of the fact that you're that you suffer from unhappiness, anxious, neurotic, all of those kinds of things, and that's hence the interest in writing this kind of a how-to book, a user's manual. Oh, sure. Yeah, I think anybody who um, gets into our line of work is probably struggle with some kind of anxiety. And I come from a pretty high-strung family. You know, we're all, everyone, well, I shouldn't say everyone, most of the people in my family are um, very motivated, um, pretty intelligent, which is not to say that I am, but they are. And Well, you have a Ph.D. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a PsyD, clin- clinical, a clinical, clinical degree. But the um, point being that it's kind of a high-strung bunch, and we, we all act out our anxiety in different ways. And <laughs> and so, um, yeah, we tend to be kind of workaholics and, and that type of thing. And I guess what really got me into the field of psychology was growing up, uh, my father had a bar, and it was a classy little place called Larry's Lounge. It was on the, the northern outskirts of Denver in a very industrial part of town, and it was kind of a rough place at the time. And I got to watch my father uh, dealing with rough customers and angry employees and, and that type of thing. It just got me fascinated in how people work. And, and in a bar, of course, you see a lot of people struggling with their own demons. And um, I got fascinated in that as well. I was, I was a very strange little kid walking around talking to these adults about their problems and wanting to know how their problems worked. Um, so you had training at a very early age in a bar. Not surprising. Bartenders are very often... Uh, considered counselors. You know, you sit down at a bar. Actually, I was with my boyfriend the other night at a bar, and <laughs> we were, uh, uh, you know, it was a fairly nice bar, but, you know, the bartender was not a good bartender, not somebody who could, I mean, we commented on this afterwards. She wasn't able to talk very well or listen very well, and she was kind of uh, not somebody I would hire as a bartender because bartenders usually have those skills, those listening skills, and, and uh um, I think that's part of the job. I wouldn't yeah, go back to that, that bar. Yeah. No. Yeah, that, bartenders have to have to have a special skill. They have to be able to, I think, um, show you some empathy, but do it quickly because they have other things to do. Right, exactly. <laughs> but uh, is your mind driving you crazy? Are, uh, the user's guide to the human mind, why our brains make us unhappy, anxious, and neurotic, and what we can do about it. Can, uh, we buy the book online, Amazon.com, bookstores everywhere. Yeah, Amazon's a great place to get it. You can go to New Harbinger's website. That's the publisher, uh, Barnes and Noble. Um, and actually, today is the release date, so I haven't been to any bookstores, but I, I understand that it's in bookstores as well. Terrific, Sean. Tell us about your blog. Do you blog every day? No, it's uh, the reason I don't blog every day is that I tend to get uh, kind of wrapped up in my blog and anxious, it's neurotic, called, and I, nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and researching, um, it's called ironshrink.com, and um, I started it, I guess, about five years ago now, and I'll answer questions that, that people send me, so someone will send me a question, can dogs learn to read, or is my ex-wife possessed, or what is relational frame theory, and so I'll go and I'll hit the literature, and sometimes I go out and talk to people, and I'll try to write an answer. It's a very highbrow site, um, especially the articles like, is my ex-wife possessed? Um, I try to have some fun with it, try to build a little humor into it, and try to contribute something useful. Is my ex-wife possessed? Well, I, I'm sure you get that question asked a lot. I want to know, though, <laughs> can dogs, can they read? Can they um, learn to read? They can, well, I guess it depends on how you define reading. They can learn to look at a symbol and respond to that symbol. So I, you know, I guess you could call that a very rudimentary style of reading. But, for example, I took my dog on this website. If you go to my website and look up, um, can dogs read or can dogs recognize symbols? Uh, poke around, you'll find it. Um, I took my dog and I, I talked to a dog trainer friend of mine and she helped me set up this little training session. It wasn't an experiment. It was a training session where I taught my dog that um, one uh, underneath one cup was a treat and underneath another cup was nothing. And I would label these cups with a star or a circle. And within a few trials, uh, my dog learned to respond to the star. She learned that that star meant that there was a treat. So... Um, 
What kind of dog is she? It, I mean, some dogs are more intelligent than others, as I understand. I mean, like poodles have a reputation for being smart. I don't know which dogs have a reputation for being dumb, but I know that some are are smarter than others. Certain breeds. Yeah, she's a she's a mutt. I think she's mostly a border <laughs> collie, and I think border collies are, are tend to be pretty smart, and mutts tend to be uh, pretty smart and, and a little less high strung. But even uh, there, there was an experiment back in the fifties that I found where someone had taught, um, I believe, an octopus and and a goldfish and a rat to look at symbols, and they all did it with some kind of success. Well, over Thanksgiving vacation. We had a lot of people at the house, and and, uh, we had a a six-month-old baby, a friend of mine's little girl, and and, um, she was able, they have now apps on uh, iPhones, maybe you know this, and like with these circles going around, different color circles, and this is a six-month-old baby learning how to press the right circle to get a noise, you know, a specific kind of noise, so six-month-old babies are learning how to use computers with success. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, and um, when my daughter was, I think, just, just one years old, a friend of ours brought over an iPhone. It was one of the first iPhones. And this kid learned how to use the iPhone. She was flicking the, the images around. And it seems to, I think, maybe that's a testament to the design of some of the technology that's out there, that it's so uh, intuitive to us that a one-year-old can learn to do it. But, yeah, children, um, there's a lot more going on in, in their brains than we realize it's because they can't communicate it to us. So what else? About, I'm always fr- curious about the blog. What other kinds of things do you blog about? I mean, you've been doing this for quite a while. Ironshrink.com, by the way, is the uh, is the website. Ironshrink.com, if you have a question. Um, I, I take some questions that aren't particularly what, what you might call safe. Like I've, I've answered some questions about the BDSM lifestyle, bondage, discipline, and sadomasochism, and I'm not a member of the lifestyle, but I, I went out and talked to people who are and uh, answered some questions. I've answered a couple of questions about that lifestyle. I answered uh, one question, and I'm just thinking back now to the, the post that continue to get the most traffic. One question that I got was from a father who was concerned that after his daughter was born that, that he might become attracted to her, physically attracted to her, sexually attracted to her, because um, he's assuming that you know, his wife is a lovely woman, so he's assuming that his daughter will be a lovely woman. And so I went out and did a little bit of research on what what is it about guys who are, what's the difference between guys who are sexually attracted to their daughters versus guys who are not sexually attracted to their daughters. That's one that gets a uh, a ton of traffic to this day, and that's uh, probably four or five years old now. Well, I'm not surprised about I, that. Isn't that one of them? If you're talking about psychoanalytic uh, therapy, that that's uh, that whole issue, that kind of Oedipal stuff that happens, being attracted to your 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 daughter or your son, isn't that something that is part of the developmental process that you have to get through that? Um, I. I don't know. That's an interesting question. If that's part of the developmental process, let me think for a second. Um, what I one of the things I ended up writing in this article is that there's some evidence from evolutionary psychology that says that when we share genes with somebody, um, it matters. We we notice when we share genes with somebody, and we're kind of wired to be sexually repelled from somebody that we're close to. But um, we can. Also, uh, when we spend a lot of time with somebody, when we grow up with them as if they're a family member, then we're also kind of sexually repelled by them. For, so, for example, there was a, a young girl in my neighborhood that I grew up with. We were the same age, and um, we spent a lot of time together between, like, the ages of five and nine, somewhere in there. So we kind of, like, raised almost like brothers and sisters. And later on in life, we, we kind of tried dating. You know, we're exactly the same age, and, and it was all very appropriate, but it just didn't feel right because she kind of felt like my sister, and there was something that that felt kind of icky about that, and I think she had a similar experience. Well, I think, though, as I understand it, we have certain taboos in our society to protect our society, so against... Uh, we need certain kinds of relationships to flourish just so that our society can continue. And when we have a taboo against something, it usually means that the urge is very strong. So we have a taboo against sleeping with your daughter or sleeping with your son. We only need a taboo because there is some kind of a, a, a there are feel, strong feelings about that. You don't need a taboo, do you, if, if, if the feelings don't exist? 
Um, well, we're getting we're getting into sociology, I think, which is not my area. But my <laughs> guess is that um, taboos can come from a couple of places. They can come from something that's just repulsive to us, like uh, you know, Penn State comes to mind. It's repulsive to think of an old man. Um, diddling a young child is just repugnant to most people, and so that taboo, I think, comes out of that revulsion of that act. But I think also a, a taboo uh, can come from what you're talking about, where there is a strong desire, a potentially strong desire, like cousins is a great example, because with a first or second cousin, we share DNA, and it, it, you can notice that there's a degree of repulsion, sexual repulsion, that corresponds with the amount of DNA that we share with a cousin. And so it can get, uh, cousins can get tricky because we're raised alongside them, but not like brothers and sisters. So we get to know them enough to maybe be attracted to them, but we don't know them intimately enough that something in our brain kicks in and says, wait a minute, this person's a relative, and um, it's it's not good for genes to, to mate with relatives. And so cousins are kind of cousins are interesting that's a tricky area um and i'm getting kind of far afield of your question but i think that if you want my opinion i think that taboos can come from both places cousins is not i mean now we are getting into sociology but as i understand cousins cousins uh traditionally in the bible and and uh and and not so long ago, people did marry cousins because that's where you live. I mean, everybody was a cousin. You lived in the same village, and it was okay. So that now it's not okay to be with a cousin because that's kind of like a an artificial kind of taboo that we've con- you know that we've created for our modern day society. But cousins always there was nobody else to marry but your cousin. I mean, that's what your, you know, families lived together. There were not that many families. They were big families. They lived in small villages, and you ended up marrying a cousin or being attracted to a cousin. We are getting off topic, but... <laughs> and right, but I, yeah, we have one last comment, because we have to say goodbye, but um, what do we want to leave our listeners with, um, besides read the book? I think what we want to leave the, the listeners with is that... Um, your mind is there to keep you safe, but it doesn't always feel like it's trying to keep you safe. Sometimes it feels like it's working against you. And the trick, I think, is, number one, to know, notice what it's doing, um, which means being able to step away from your thoughts and, and treat them as if they're not factual, even if they feel factual. And then, number two, to, to build some choices around what your mind is telling you. These are not natural things for us to do, and it takes a lot of work. And um, the, the only criticism I've gotten about the book so far is that it doesn't provide quick and easy answers because this isn't a quick and easy process. But it, it doesn't take a, a lifetime of practice. It can You can start to make progress pretty quickly in stepping away from what your mind is doing to you. Terrific. Good advice. Sean T. Smith, psychologist in private practice in Denver, Colorado, and author of The U- User's Guide to the Human Mind. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. We're going to take a short break. I'm Catherine Zox, your social worker with a microphone. You are listening to The Social Workers here on WCDB 90.9. Don't go away. We'll be back in a minute. I knew I was stuck at this kid's house for the night. I decided to just go to sleep and get the night over with. But those guys came into the bedroom and got into a massive pillow fight. Let me tell you, it's not easy falling asleep when a sweaty little kid falls on you every five seconds. Even after the lights went out, Raleigh and his friends stayed up. A bunch of them snuck up on me to try and pull the hand in a bowl of warm water trick. Well, that was enough for me. I went downstairs to sleep in the basement even though it was pitch black. I left my sleeping bag upstairs and that was a mistake because it was freezing. I think it was probably the longest night of my life. When the sun came up this morning, I found out the reason it was so cold. I was sleeping right by the sliding glass door and some fool had gone and left it open overnight. That really stunk because if I knew there was a way to escape last night, I definitely would have taken it. To read more about the sleepover, check out Diary Diary of a Wimpy Kid, The Last Straw by Jeff Kenney. Explore new worlds and check out more cool books at your local library. And visit read.gov. Brought to you by the Library of Congress and the Ad Council. Hey, Billy. Yeah? Do you want to go to the state fair? Yeah. Do you want to ride the roller coaster? Yeah. The big one? Yeah. The one with the reverse flip? <gasps> yeah! Well, you can't. Huh? You see, Billy, when you throw away money on wasted electricity, you throw away everything you could have done with it, including going to the state fair. Oh, man. Cheer up. This year, your parents will make it right. 
They're going to visit energysavers.gov where they'll get tips on how to save energy and money. Then they'll add extra insulation and get a few of those Energy Star appliances. They could save hundreds of dollars a year. And you know what, Billy? What? They'll take you to the state fair <gasps> next year. But I want to go this year. I know you do, Billy. I know you do. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Energy and the Ad Council. We're back. I'm Catherine Zox, your social worker with a microphone. You're listening to The Social Workers on WCDB 90.9, Albany, New York. Andrew, I have a question for you. Okay. I'm, yeah, you know, I was reading the newspaper this morning. I always try to read the Albany Times Union before I do my show, <laughs> what's happening in and around the community. But uh, I wanted to get your take on this Penn State thing, because I haven't really asked you about that. you are I call you a student. I know you've graduated already, but you're pr- closer to being a student than I am. So... I haven't been following it at all. At all? No. But you know I, what I'm... Okay. I know um, roughly what happens, that uh, one of the assistant coaches was doing something very in- inappropriate throughout his entire tenure with the school. And this has a number of people upset. Um, other coaches have been fired, right? Uh, Syracuse, um, I think. somebody, uh, One of those coaches has allegedly done some stuff as well now. Huh. But, yeah. I think that was last week. I don't know that much about yeah, that. Yeah, but I, I feel like at the at Penn State there were other coaches at the football in the football team that were also removed um, over issues like this. But outside of that, I really haven't been paying attention. I'm very under-informed about most things. Well, you should read the Times Union this morning. <laughs> it, it, it makes me it makes me anxious and unhappy and nervous and neurotic and neurotic. And so you need to read the book, Mm -hmm. The User's Guide to the Human Mind, so it won't make you anxious and neurotic. You need to know about this. Because I was curious about, uh, you know, when I was in college, I mean, I wasn't really, sports was not, I went to BU and hockey was a big sport. So, I mean, we all went to hockey games and stuff. But this, this, I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, were you involved in sports here? No. no? I've never been one for sports. Are there any sports you can do? Um, not really. <laughs> I I bike a lot. Well, that's a sport. It's a sport, but it's not a com- you don't do it as a comp- as competition. You've no, never been involved in competitive not sports, really. yeah. Because uh, you know, I keep going back to that Penn State thing, though, Andrew. I am just, and I'm not the only one. It's really awful to think that something like that could go on for twenty, yeah, thirty years, and no one would do anything or no one would mm-hmm. say anything um i i guess it boggles my mind and I, I, I and it's amazing because these people are in such positions of trust you have yeah. to trust them um you're forced to your kids are off with them and such a betrayal of trust like that is just like shocking it's more shocking i almost think than the actual act but well no you said the word trust and i think one of the things is that people who do that who abuse children and we've had several people on our show who have been abused one by her nanny if you remember a mm-hmm. couple of weeks ago because she trusted her people teacher i mean unfortunately it those kinds of people put themselves in positions of trust where kids are going to trust you i mean purposefully do that so yeah. then they have access to these to these children um uh, which is horrific and they you know kids traditionally are supposed to look up with authority at their teacher at their coach at you know at, and so um at their nanny at their babysitter yeah uh, yeah it's it's not I don't a, trust anyone no <laughs> well you have to trust somebody nope. you trust your girlfriend yeah unless unless she's running the radio station then i don't trust her she has a position here at the station she does yes she's, she's the general manager. The general manager. So we're in good stead here, right? Uh, I I think. So what did you two do for Thanksgiving? Um, we we stayed around here. We missed a bus, um, and we. Do you were, take the Bolt bus? Uh, no, we were taking Greyhounds um, because we were going out to uh, Western New York. Um, we missed it, so we stayed here um, and hung out with some friends and ate. We had had a had Thanksgiving with some friends earlier in the week. Um, 
they we had a turducken so we ate turducken. Oh, that's what I wanted to ask you. We have only like a minute left. Mm-hmm. Say that again or spell it. What kind of du- what is that? It, it was a turducken. It was a turkey stuffed with a duck that was stuffed with a chicken. Um, it was amazing. What does it taste like? Is it real? It must be very rich. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was, and it's um. It's just strange because all the all the different birds are deboned. So you have something that looks like a turkey, um, and it's got the turkey like legs and wings, and those have bones in them. But the rest of the middle, you can just cut like a, in slices. So it's a very bizarre thing to to watch. But Andrew, can you get that recipe online for a true duckin? Uh, I, Drew duckin, true t- tur. Tur, oh, like turkey, Tur- turkey, turkey duckin. duckin. Yeah. Is there a recipe for a turkey duckin? Where did that come from? Um, he ordered it. The friend of mine who got it ordered it um, online. I, I'm sure there's there's a way. There's got to be recipes online. Well, if you can order it online, you could. Yeah, there must be recipes for it. It sounds delicious, actually. It was it was very good. Um, so that's what we did for both of our Thanksgivings. So we learned something new, right? A tur duckin. Tur duckin. I'm going to go after the show. I'm going to look it up. <laughs> and maybe we'll have one next year for our <laughs> Thanksgiving dinner. We had two turkeys because I think two turkeys is they're tastier instead of making one big turkey that you have to cook mm-hmm. all day and it's tends to, it can dry out. So we yeah. had two different turkeys. And we had a turkey that was that you can we ordered online as well from New Jersey from hmm. this this kind of specialty turkey place. And it had it was they have three or four different types of turkeys. They breed the original turkey that the pilgrims had. And oh, I'm going to wow. say this, and then we're going to say goodbye. But it's called a heritage turkey. Huh. And th- originally, the turkeys that the, the pilgrims had were more dark meat, and they were leaner. That hmm. They were just a different breed of turkey. And we all like dark meat in our family, so we ordered that turkey. That was one of them, and then an organic turkey. But as... As things evolved, uh, Americans tend to like bigger turkeys and whiter turkeys, so they started breeding bigger, whiter turkeys, and that's what they primarily sell in the grocery stores. Mm. But you can order these more leaner, darker turkeys called heritage turkeys. That makes sense, though. Yeah. Actually, I found out really something really sad. The the turkey that gets pardoned. Um, that the president pardoned? Yes. Like two of them, right? Or, yeah. yeah. There's like one, and then there's a backup in case the first one doesn't feel like being pardoned that day. Both of them wind up living their re- the rest of their lives on some farm. But because they're just they're the birds that someone would eat, they've been bred so that they wind up having, for meat, so they wind up having a lot of health problems, and they only live about another year um, after they've been pardoned. Which is sort of sad. It is sad. It, you know, it's, well, it's a turkey's life. What can you say? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're going to say goodbye. Andrew White and Catherine Sox, you've been listening to us on WCDB, the social workers at the University of Albany. Have a great... Find us, find us on Twitter. Yeah. Um, find us on Facebook. Um, we're there. Um, the Twitter handle is Social Workers FM. Facebook, just search for us. We come up. Um, and the show will be up later today. Great. Have a great day, and we'll see you next week.